Welcome to this BFI Home Theatre edition, which is going to be looking at the film Burning an Illusion. With me today is the lead of the film, Cassie McFarland, along with the director, Melanie Shabazz, Janet Kay, Margaret Greer, Victor Romero Evans, and myself, Kunle Olulode from African Odyssey, who's going to be firing the questions at our guest today. To kick off with, it's been 40 years, I think roughly since this film uh, came out. And I must admit some of the themes that it tackles um, really does echo with some of the things that are confronting society today, particularly those from black and minority uh, communities. Uh, and my first question, really, I'm going to direct at Melanick, the director. Melanick Shabazz, I mean, Black women in 1981 were really featured in much of the material that was put out, both in terms of the British film industry and even stateside. There are very few films that really focus on the position of Black women uh, in society. So what made you decide to, to tackle this subject? And um, at the time, what did you think about uh, the BFI uh, involvement uh, in that project? Right. Um, I didn't really come into the idea of the project on that kind of thinking. Um, I just had a vision or something came to me in a moment. Um, it was an idea and it was a, a woman looking at herself in the mirror and that was a trigger. So I wasn't really thinking about the fact that there weren't black women in, in, you know, in cinemas or, or in lead roles in films. I was really just thinking about the story and, and going off from there. So that was the, it was a creative consideration more than a sense of the time in relation to that kind of story. And were you thinking that the film would connect uh, with a certain audience or were you just um, completely, I suppose, driven to, to get the story out? Second, yes. I was more driven to get the story out than... Um, I mean, I, in, in the story, in writing it, I was conscious of an audience, definitely. But I wasn't sh sure what response would come from the audience. It was really, at, this, at that time, following through with the vision because um, it didn't start off with me um, writing a feature length script. It started off as a short story and that the BFI then gave me some money to develop into, um, uh, well, sorry, the, the BFI gave me some money to develop into a short story. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. And then on the journey of it being a short story, it just grew and grew and grew into what it became. Um, so it was all very much um, subconscious. It was all very much driven by the idea and the story and me wanting to do a drama. So I'm going to move now to Cassie, who, of course, uh, plays the central figure of Pat. Um, Cassie, going back to this issue of representations of women on screen, I was thinking about it as I was watching the film again for the first time in many years. Um, apart from probably Spike Lee, which really comes in in the 90s, there's nobody else making films about black women and the relationships between black women and their men. To my mind, uh, it must have been quite a, 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 a weight to carry um, that responsibility in this film being the central character. So what's your kind of response to that? I think Spike Lee, you're right about Spike Lee being the only director who featured um, the story of a really black woman at the center of a narrative, um, film narrative. There, there's, I'm quite sure there's nobody else doing that at the time. And She's Got a Habit, which was Spike Lee's first film, I think, the first sort of successful film, came after Burn, not long after Burning Illusion, but when we did Burning, Pat was very much the only black woman leading any sort of film narrative that I was aware of. 
I was 22, not doing too bad. I had my own flat, a steady job, but that wasn't enough. I wanted to settle down. Some other one never seemed to meet anybody I could really feel for. You know what I mean? When I watched Pressure, I was quite, I enjoyed it and it was a great film, but I was surprised to see um, how little um, the story of the women in that film featured in, in the narrative. And, um, and I was, yeah, when I did Bernie, I was aware of the responsibility. It, nobody knew that it would, be, it would become as successful as it did, but certainly we all knew that it was an important film and that I felt an even greater responsibility happening than most because I was in every scene, my character was in every scene, and I knew that the responsibility was mine to really carry um, a lot of the, um, the drive, the narrative drive of the film. And so um, I worked really hard on it. I think I had ba bags under my eyes in most of the scenes because I didn't sleep much. Um, Menlik and I would have meetings, we'd talk about where the character was going, we'd talk about how to, um, um, how the character is evolving, how she, you know, there's a lot of work that we did behind the scenes that hopefully you don't see in, in, uh, on the screen because that's supposed to be, supposed to stay, stay at the back of, of the film. And so, yeah, um, it was a big responsibility and I hope that we, um, we um, sort of, you know, we, we met it, we met that responsibility, I hope so. So I think when Benedict asked me to do it, and I said, why did you choose me? Because I'm so not that role. He said, because precisely because you're not that role, because you had great ideas and you, you brought something some, so much to the table when you came and saw me. Um, and we, we, did, we really got on. We discussed the, the potential, the possibility of what could happen and how it, the film could evolve. And there's a lot of improvisation, men and will admit, um, but, but it was only possible because there was such a strong idea um, that he um, that he had, and so we had so much to work with um, that um, yeah, I think it, it it was very much a team effort. It was so much a team a team um, effort for all the actors involved, and from Menelik giving and inspiring us to do the best we could. Okay, I'm going to bring Victor in here. Uh, the relationship um, that Pat has, she's clearly. Um, in the film, the provider, and it seems like Dell is very much the recipient, much to his own uh, frustration. And in many ways, the um, continuance of that relationship is almost like right from the beginning, you could see there were kind of fault lines um, until I suppose eventually Pat herself puts her foot down. When you were playing the role of Dell, um, did you feel at the time that it was kind of representative of experiences or relationships that you were aware of? Or did, and, and, and do you think that even today, it still has kind of um, reverberations? Um, yeah, I mean, at that time, doing the film, I hadn't lived with a woman. So it was amazing that when I did eventually lived with a woman, deja vu's. <laughs> <laughs> I would say to myself, I've done this before in a film. <laughs> so it's, it, I wasn't aware of the dynamics of relationships, as I said, because I hadn't lived with a woman and it was, it was, it was so real that what Menelik, it just, it dawned on me, he wrote the truth. And having done the film, it had taught me a lot. The film helped me, in fact, deal with the situations which I encountered having lived with a woman. Have we moved on? It, yeah, we've moved on, we've moved on, we've moved on. I mean, it, 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 it taught me a lot. Um, so Janet, uh, Margaret and Cassie, what's your views? And on the situation where I suppose um, Pat finds herself um, she's the breadwinner, but actually um, the male uh, assumes dominance in the household. Um, to many of us today, I suppose it seems uh, quite ridiculous, but I agree with um, Victor that at the time, I was aware of many relationships like that. And it still seems to me 
that um, there are issues to be dealt with. I think back in the day, um, it was easier for women in terms of job finding, mm -hmm. housing. It was the women that always had that down pat first. Um, <laughs> am I... Am I, am I lying? No, sure. It was easier. No, 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 you're yeah. right. Absolutely. Yeah, it right. was right. easier. And I think that's why that situation uh, was as it was. But I think I, I, I do see and have seen reverberations of that now in this mm. time as well. No, I, I, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I was saying um, earlier, just kind of reliving and looking at, at the film again. I mean, there's so many of their kind of scenes and discussions that I could just see myself <laughs> um, as Pat and, uh, you know, even relationships with my mum and that kind of dominant and the questioning of somebody ringing on the phone. I mean, it was just like reliving a memory of, mum, do you really have to go there? Uh, the other group of English boys and girls of your age. Hello? Yeah, what? what is this? Yeah, comes back to culture, doesn't it? Who? Del? Del who? They bring us up the way they were brought up back home. Yes, but, but what are you to my daughter? But they don't adhere to the standards of the country. A friend? It's where you know her from. It was I see. I see. Well, where you want her for? Yes, yeah, she's here. Wait a minute. Pat is one of your concubines, then. Sorry, Mom. Just everything about it and how Melanie looked at the scripts and, and the acting, yeah, you could just see that. I mean, partners that I that I could actually put myself in that situation. Um, but I do, I do think we've moved further forward. But for women at that time, it was much easier to kind of get into those situations and quite easily be the breadwinner, as it were, or the person that providing, and then that relationship becoming very frustrating in terms of the dominance in 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 in, in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Definitely, mm -hmm. nothing's changed. Nothing's yeah. changed because we've got youths, we've got the, the we've got children, and we look at the dynamics of the relationship that they get into, and I mean, it's just the language has changed. Mm. You know. Well, they're yeah. calling each other brother and cousin, your fam and all that, but it's the same, the dynamic is still the same. Yeah. They're still going through the same stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the, there is a confidence about Pat in the early part of the film. Mm -hmm. She's ambitious, she's outgoing, um, in a way that um, I suppose Dale is trying to deal with his work situation and uh, a society that he feels is relatively hostile towards him. And yet, the funny thing is that if you look at the entertainment industry, particularly the black entertainment in industry, it's very noticeable that people who are promoters and organizers of events, uh, the major part of the audience that comes out now is female. Um, in terms of income and disposable income, I mean, it seems within the black community, female disposable income has become queen, if you like. Um, and I've organized things like uh, spoken word events mm -hmm. where it's predominantly female and we're looking around and people are asking, where are the males? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think for a younger generation, if anything, the gap has actually widened uh, yeah. than when the film was made in 1981, which yeah. is a bit, a bit worrying really. Can I just say something on that? On, um, because the film and the relationship um, marks the beginning of an era, which was a shift from our parents. It was a shift. There was there was a time when it was expected that the man was the breadwinner mm -hmm. um, situation, and the shift happened when we were. Um, I think the government also introduced a policy where women can who have babies where children could get apartment, get flats and so on, called it flats at the time, apartments. And that then meant that a space was opened up for women. And um, 
and the shift in terms of their empowerment. Not just that, but that was a marker in terms of that generation were generally growing up with your parents. You're trying to find a little space for yourselves, but it was difficult. But that shift, that situation meant that women could have their own space. And then, then the men then responded to that. And I think that that relationship was really to mark the shift in empowerment and power with dynamics um, that, that became much more pronounced later and you see today. Mm. Um, so it was, it was really a marker of the things to come mm. in terms of the dynamics of the in, you know, female empowerment and what that then meant to the black male. So Margaret, mm -hmm. you're a, a black female trade union leader one of the few in history. Um, you uh, are also um, an entertainer, you're a singer, and uh, you lived through this era. So what was your kind of reflections looking at the film some years on? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, I mean, I think I expressed it to Cassie that I could actually see myself in her and her in me. I mean, it was a portrayal of empowerment of um thinking and looking at you know where do I fit in in terms of dynamic of the relationship that she had not just with um her partner but also with her um family um and friends the music um the transition from you know and even though what Menek said about you know the kind of government legislation that came out this was a young girl that was 22 that actually had a flat of her own. I mean, that was unique in itself, that as a black young woman growing up, then that's something that I would and could aspire to. Um, so it's, it's about what narrative you want to take from that. I mean, I took that that was the start of our liberation and actually as a couple, and no matter how much the dynamics that happened, they stood together. You know, that court scene, when you know that sentence came out and you know said what kind of justice do you call it? it you know it it's those things that you see that you know every day that actually these are powerful moments that we need to then make sure that we're actually educating our next generation about that and that's that's how I see that that film I think that film now if it's shown can verberate so many things as it did back in 19 81 and I'm not being disrespectful to some of the series that I've seen come out over you know in terms of small acts but I think that is a true representation of the dynamics of the black relationship family life empowerment and and as a black woman you know I I, I can I can see myself in in her because um, can I can I say something because I need to really understand what men are saying here because Nobody gave Pat her flat. Nobody gave her anything. She actually really worked hard for what she, and, and she kept pushing that. She kept saying that throughout um, her arguments with, with um, Dell. And that was so important that she, look, I'm working hard for what I have. You need to contribute. I mean, I don't think we can just brush it aside that that character, because it says something, it made, you made a really big statement that this guy was allowing himself to be defeated. And what Pat was saying all the way through is like, look, I could be defeated, but I want you to stand with me and together we can get, get, go through, we can, get, we can do this. I mean, it was great that at the end they do come together. Part of their arc was they had to go through all of this and then they come together. And I would love to have seen another film to show actually that relationship as it as it Blossom. developed, Blossom. as it blossomed, as it became, you know, what it could have been. And that's what I think is important, <laughs> is that throughout all of the turmoil, out of the destruction, out of the difficulties, they stuck together. Because love and understanding and knowing that, yes, I might be going here, but I see your struggle as a, as a male partner, that actually Dell could appreciate that in the end, because yes. it's all about give and take. And even though he might have been angry or upset, it was frustration. And that's what I see in a lot of 
our young people, I mean, my own family, my brothers, that frustration of knowing that you have the talent, the skills and the dynamics, but the system is not allowing you to do that. And to have to be able to work through that and to get to a point where you and, and, and your woman, as it were, people say partners in that now, can actually come to an understanding. That is the power. That is the, the empowerment of the black family, the black relationship that I take from that, okay. um, that film. Okay, thank you for that, Margaret. Um, I'm gonna move on now and look at another question, which is the issue of uh, reggae music. Uh, different subject matter slightly, but I think is intrinsic to the atmosphere at the time. And certainly uh, in looking at the, the careers of um, Victor, Janet, um, and thinking about particularly the smash hit that you had, Janet, Silly Games, uh, Victor, uh, I remember, you know, dancing to uh, At The Club and many other tunes that you brought at that time. A unique British music form, Lovers Rock, emerged. Um, and it features, again, quite heavily in the film. Um, what are your observations, Janet, uh, Victor? And yeah, yourself, Melanick, uh, was it important to you to make sure those elements were in the film? For me, music is always important and reggae music really plays a large part of most of my films. And so um, this was no different. Definitely um, the film embraced the lovers aspect and it embraced the conscious aspect. Um, and so music was definitely always um, and always will be and reggae music in particular was very much to my heart. And so yeah, it was natural that I would put that music in the film. Music is the backdrop to everything. And Lovers Rock in the mid 70s to early 80s when the film was made, that was when Lovers Rock was at its peak, its beginning. By the time we got to 1980, it was peaking. Um, and from my perspective, you know, we are second generation um, West Indians being brought up in were being brought up in this country. And like you said, Lovers Rock was a, a, a unique British form of reggae. We were writing at that time when we were writing this new, this new music about our lives, about falling in love for the first time, you know, how, how our relationships would be, who would be our life partner, That, that's what we were writing about. Just to set the scene, you know, I was, I think, about 
18 at the time. Um, and in the track listing, you have Black Harmony. Uh, I remember Black Harmony's producer, Castro Brown, over there in Clapham Junction, uh, the uh, one side. And further down, you had Dub Vendor. Um, the, the names, 15, 16, 17, Black Harmony, uh, Brown Sugar. Um, Louisa uh, Mark. Louisa Marks. Um, Jackson, Gina Sandra Cross. <laughs> yeah. Um, it goes on and on. Yeah. So yeah, it was an extremely rich um, cultural outpouring at that time, um, which- but did, Have you noticed though, that all the names that we've mentioned, all female, Lovers yeah. Rock was very yes. female dominated. dominated. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm. for me, <laughs> it's an, uh, you know, I have those records. Um, the late Jean uh, Adebambo is sorely missed. But um, it was almost like just as the political experience mm -hmm. of policing was underground, so was the music. <laughs> um, I didn't see articles in the music press, in New Musical Express, for example, on Lover's Rock. I didn't see it in Melody Maker. Um, and it was almost like living in two different worlds. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I, I was, I think I was earning a few quid on the side uh, as a box boy, um, stringing up for sound systems at the time while I was in university um, trying to get through. But I, but I distinctly remember it was like two different worlds, um, not just in relation to um, class, but also race. Uh, and so the first inklings of even hip hop were only just beginning to percolate with African Bambata in 1981, Planet Rock. But reggae itself, whilst it may have been uh, you know, known about as a music form, Lovers Rock was completely underground. Yeah, I mean, when we left school, I mean, many, many uh, going to the arts was all new for us, for us young black Londoners, black, black, you know, black Englanders, as it were, you know. So all, all of it was new. Yeah, all of it was new. And it was a music was a it was the first thing that we went to that was ours. And it also showed us that we could we could that we could actually produce something from ourselves without, you know, we didn't have help from no, we didn't go to no singing schools, we didn't, we didn't have, have we didn't have we didn't have, we didn't have no have training, anything. no nothing. You know, we just went by what we heard and what we saw. And what we felt. Yeah, and absolutely. Mm -hmm and what we felt even in even going into films going into television this is all brand new to us we didn't have nobody we didn't have nobody before us well we had we had Norman Beaton we had some of our elder actors but we didn't have no young act no young there wasn't a plethora of young black actors before us so that we could say well, we're going to follow them we everything the was new so here. you know as far as we're concerned we there was nothing we couldn't do because it, it, we weren't following nobody. We would, we, this was, we were just creating. So, you know, doing um, Menelik's film, it was just excitement for me that, that particular time in the um, uh, late seventies, mid, mid seventies, early eighties, it was, there was a, there was a, a lot of black, a young, young black theater groups, you know, young artists singing, singing reggae tunes. It was a very vibrant, vibrant and electrifying time. Tonight is my night, I'm going to shine so bright. I'm going to stand beneath the light. I put on my baggy trouser. For your night? Yeah. Why? I'll give myself 10 out of 10. Star peel. Ten out of ten. For star high. Star high. And ten out of ten. For murder. <laughs> what do you think? Mm, take a shirt colour out. It don't look so nice. No man, you're too old fashioned. Let me style it done there already. Uh -huh. Hurry up, man. Chimney soon come. I'm gonna make myself look nice then. You've been at it for an hour now. You're not gonna look no better. Thank you very much. No charge. And the other part of the, I suppose, the arts and cultural side that 
I'd never really picked up from the film until I watched it again over the weekend was the question of literature and the role that that played in the film. So Melanek, I spied, I think it was um, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa mm -hmm. in there. And mm -hmm. also one of the key scenes is when um, Pat is taking a whole box of um, Barbara Cartland novels and throwing and them in the beach. Mills and Boone, Mills and Boone. I had some of that. I had some of that. I had some of that. In terms of that burning and illusion. We know, we know, we know Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> you already said you, you could see, you were, you were Pat, and oh, Pat okay. was you. So we know you read that book then. <laughs> to be honest, as long as people read, I'm not really that bothered. Mills and Boom, Barbara Cartland, but I understand the transference in consciousness mm. that Melanick was trying to convey. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting with the Black Lives Matters protests last summer, part of the response to that was suddenly there was whole production of reading lists. People were talking about you had to, you had to read books um, and particularly um, this time targeting at, at white people. These are the mm -hmm. books you should be reading. So we had, you know, Robert D'Angelo's White Fragility, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Literature, again, seems to be part of a discourse around elevating consciousness. Yeah. And yeah. I think that um, I thought it was interesting, as I say, it's something in the film that I'd not really kind of picked up on before till I saw, I think it was the end, uh, she was um, redesigning her flat and she's got an elephant on the top of a stack of books. And in there, I could see Black Jacobin. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm like that, a bit of an anorak. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting the way you actually use the literature to get that point across. Yes, um, I grew up with books in terms of in my consciousness period. And uh, I was working in a bookshop and I was an activist. And this whole film really comes out of that whole drive, whole, you know, and the books that I read shaped me and, um, and the journey of Pat in the film was about transference and knowledge. And um, it was just a natural thing for me to bring in. Um, you also had books, you had posters, like in the scene where Pat is with um, her friend um, in the scene where they're kind of dancing. I um, oh. forgot the name. Uh, could you believe it? Um, Angela. Angela, but I'm thinking of her um, the character. The, and the character in the film Cynthia. was Cynthia. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, yeah, where you had the posters on the wall and yeah. stuff. So it was bringing in a whole Black consciousness um, for me. The whole film was about Black consciousness and rising to that, being part of that, becoming it. And, um, and the love story became the vehicle to express that. Mm. But certainly the books were, um, was, yeah, were there in the background and important for me. Um, and uh, it comes from my um, conscious days being the Black Power Movement and being around bookshops and in bookshops and um, reading the, a lot of these books. So yes, um, that element was important. I'm gonna um, just draw things because I think we're, we're running out of time, but I have one more question, which is that you know, through uh, Pat's experience, uh, we're able to capture an essence of what racism was like, both um, in wider society and inside the workplace. And, um, I feel that uh, the idea that was posed by Cassie about, well, there should have been a kind of sequel. Um, so this is a question to all of you. Um, so what do you think that Pat will be like um, today, looking at out on the world um, in 2021? What would be the things that would be of concern to her? Um, and hopefully Dell. <laughs> Um, still there by her side. I think she'd be interested in not being silenced. And I think she'd be interested in 
issues around her feminism, her gender. She'd want to be sure that what she has to say has weight and her, and is and, and, and that she's listened to. Um, and um, she would want to make sure that other women in the workplace, she'd want to make sure that other women in relationships, um, in families, um, are empowered um, and are engaged, politically engaged, socially engaged. Um, she'd want to, she'd probably be, I think she probably would be um, a trade unionist or she may be a lawyer and she would, the character of um, Pat would, would not be somebody who would be squashed um, and, and, and um, she would be somebody who would fight for her own rights and fight for her own um, uh, place in society and she'd fight for the place of other women in society. I don't think she'd be um, somebody who um, could be sat upon. For me, it will be much more to do with the relationships and the learning and the lessons and taking it down that road because of the times. The, the, the issue of the, 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 the arc of that story was suited to that time in terms of the political dynamics of things. Uh, and, you know, um, but by the time we moved on, or it, we were in a different era and I would want to locate it in a different era which is to do much more with her and Dell's relationship and the issues that are going to come up in relation to their dynamics. Um, so that's where I would take it very different. And that's okay. why I write the script. Okay. And Margaret, any thoughts on this? Um, I think it would have been a bit of both, really. I think, you know, I think we can see that, you know, if that relationship had developed as I believe and hope it would, that actually we may be looking at what we're seeing now on screen in terms of Janet and Victor, that you've got that dynamic of opposites, but you've got a relationship that has grown fundamentally together. And if you've got children in that, that you can still have a career, you can still have those dynamics, you can still have those relationships because you're guiding the next generation. So that's where I would have wanted to see if there was a, another series and you know you can always use me as an example of that because that's exactly where I am in terms of my career and my relationships and now you know guiding the next generation because it had it had to have been that family unit in some kind of way to be able to move forward so that's that's where that's where I see that film happening for me. Okay thank you Margaret and I want to give the last word to Janet and Victor. <laughs> the last word to us. Huh? Well, um, <laughs> as pertains to, to the character, um, Cassie's character, is the film ends with her being very, um, to me, she's very, she becomes a very compassionate. She, her, her compassionate side comes out a lot in the film. So I would see her as very much somebody who goes into to education because she was, you know, she, how the movie, how she's portrayed in the movie, she's, you know, she's educated, you know, she's well read and so forth in, in, in the literature, the initial literature, and then she, she becomes roots, she becomes, she becomes conscious. So I would see her somehow going into an educational capacity where, where she, she tried to make the, the especially the women, the, the young women, Avoid the, the the pitfalls of of that that illusionary lifestyle that 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 you know that the West proposes. That's that's I would see her going into an educational capacity. Mm. I don't, as for Dell, I think the same thing. You know, not not necessarily like um, how Cassie ends up, but he's more militant. You know. Well, I mean, yeah, I would just say, but there have to be some conflict, obviously, and so course, you have to course. find the port because that is very idealistic in terms of how we do it. So I would, that's what I'm saying. I think that it's very difficult to make a film where it's just, everyone is going I, on a nice- I didn't say there'd tangent. be no conflict, man. No, I didn't say, no, 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 I didn't say he was. I'm just saying, I'm adding. I'm yeah. really adding to what, what I'm saying is like, for me, it would be to find the conflict mm. in that and what is gonna, out of that, what will happen? You know what I mean? Because it's easy to go along. She's on a nice little path. And it's the same in the in the book, in the film, actually. She's on a nice little path. 
when she starts well, it's not a film. nice little path it's a path well, when i say like, with... <laughs> well no in her mind in her mind it's a it's a comfortable path and then something happens that jolts that and then out of that you know you'll come into her life and you know in the character and you're jolting that 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 comfortability so in the same way that the the the, the 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 any follow-up would kind of have to follow okay can i just bring family. janice into it because she yeah. hasn't spoken yet yeah, yes janice say- I would have liked to have seen the family dynamic because okay. when you have the children and they get to their young teenage years, yeah. they have a different mindset mm-hmm. to what we had. We had a different mindset to our parents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, our parents had that idealistic kind of yeah. uh, impression about how our life was how, supposed how, to go. How they'd like to. How, how, yeah, how, would they, how they would like us to turn out, how they would like us to be. And again, still, our children have a completely different mindset as well. So them moving from where they were to where they end up at the end of the movie and then having their children, it would have been nice to see the dynamics between their children and them and them trying to impose what they now know on their children who will definitely have a different mindset to them and, and, yeah. and see the, the drama behind all of that. And with that, I'm afraid time has run out and I'm gonna to have to bring things to an end. But I just want to say a big thank you to Cassie, Melanick, Margaret, Janet, and Victor. And, thank you. You know, uh, I hope that um, people receive this uh, recording well, and that will generate uh, new questions and maybe new ideas in terms of how we uh, depict uh, drama uh, at the level of the UK Black experience, and also enable people to understand the parallels and shifts that people have lived through and gone through to get to where they are today. So thank you all. Thank Thank you. you. Thank Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching at home. Burning an Illusion is available to watch on BFI Player now, and you can claim a free BFI Player subscription trial with the code BFI YouTube. If you enjoyed this event, please subscribe to the BFI YouTube channel for more Q&As. Thank you and good night.